Hello, this is Hakuna Bean, and today we are going to be reading in another creepypasta called I've Been Dreaming Things I Shouldn't. I don't know why I decided to go with another one that's relating to dreams or sleeping. I just did. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I'll try to make some more er, er, stories based on spooky spaghetti if I can. Now let's get right into this. Dreams are a wholly different experience depending on who you ask. Some claim to have bizarre and vivid dreams every night, others say they don't dream at all. Are there ads? I thought Adblock was working on that. Oh well. If you were to ask me, I'd say it's not so black and white. That I'm somewhere between the two extremes. Though I tend towards dreaming less than the average person, yeah, it's probably true we dream every night and just don't remember it, but for all practical purposes, that's the same as not dreaming at all. That's about where I stand with the subject. Honestly, I've heard of nightmares. Not the, you watch your family get murdered kind of nightmares, but those are that, that are more ambient, unique. Always drag the foretell dread beneath the surface. And I, and while I enjoy a good spook or two, they can be a problem if they overstay their welcome. What I'm saying is, I don't like recurring dreams. Just the idea makes me uneasy. Have your brain hitting the exact same notes as it had before. Make no mistake, I'm a, I'm a skeptic against regular human that and tells, and I don't believe dreams have it, superstitious meanings, no divine messages for me. It's because it's like being forced to watch a movie again and again. It was fun the first time, but loses its charm on the second watch, and the third, and the fourth, and the 317th and with my experience with the Harry Potter and the Goblet and the Fire movie that I freaking heard when I was a kid. The only difference is that when I have a recurring dream, it feels like the first time, and I only realize I've had it after waking up. After recursion, I could pass off as a coincidence, a child of stress, perhaps. That if it's one dream. Thing is, I've been having these same dreams for about half a year now, and there's four of them. I can't record the. I can't recall the order I first had them in. I can't say with any certainty if there's an intended order at all. These are dreams, after all, and unless Hitchcock's ghost is haunting me and directs my dreams, then the most I can do is record them in the sequence that seems most likely. Every time I have them, there are only minor differences, but they play out relatively the same. The first dream is no different. I'm at one end of a long alley or aisle when the first dream starts. At first, I always think it's a high street somewhere. There's stalls and wooden trolling set up along the sides, running all the way down to the end. I don't feel scared or anything. Not yet. Actually, I feel content. I stroll comfortably down the long stretch, listening to people all conversing, bartering, and taking in the smell of, the far of a farmer's market. As I walk, I look above me. The aisle is enclosed by tall metal shelves, making me think I must be in a warehouse. Or a builder's merchant. Even if the shelves are empty, when I look back down and observe the scene, I come to an immediate halt. All the saws and cars are still there. But there's no people and no products. It's completely empty. It feels like there should be people, and I say something like, Oh, right. Like I already knew no one was there, but only just remembered. Except there is someone. At the far end of the aisle, where the market stops. At first, I'm too far to make out any distinguishing details. But after picking up the pace and walking further, they come into focus. I recognize him as an old friend from middle school, Jason. He's older though, taller, with thin stubble and dark hair in need of a trim. 
but I know it's him. Some square glasses, same green eyes, as I remember. He's behind a wooden counter, and behind him is a huge, spotless window. It looks out into an expanse of reeds growing from black water. They don't sway or move at all. And the sky is embers, like it's sunset, but there's no sun. Despite not having seen Jason in years, I have no desire to get reacquainted. It would be trivial at this time and place. You're late. The words seem to waft out from him, like they were being held in his lungs for just his moment. But they've spent so long sitting there, they've become stagnant. Did I miss the harvest market? At first he says quiet. Though his lips remain parted, I think he might be shivering. Slipped away, he says, sighing and shaking his head, like he said all he has us to say. He raises an arm and points off to his left. I look in the direction he's pointing and see something. I'm not really sure what it is. Not a dream, at least. It's brightly colored, almost cheery. And shiny. Rounded. Hard and shiny. The colors are never the same. Sometimes it's bright red, sometimes navy blue. And other times are a particularly obnoxious yellow. Jason starts to whisper something, but the dream always ends before I can make out what he's saying. While I wouldn't go as far as to say this dream is a nightmare, there's an undercurrent of things being out of place. It's like when you go somewhere and forget to bring something. But having it realized it's missing if the summer was dark and empty, of course, in the day of night, you're missing something much more important than your phone or wallet. Obscure impressions aside, this dream is nothing special. It's barely coherent. It's the other dreams I've been having that lend it gravity. I had this one a few times before any of the others cropped up. The second dream is different. The first always makes me uneasy, but in this one, I feel scared. It's kind of scared where you wake up in the dark, sheets ruffled and tack you with cold sweat while you paw around blindly for the bed lamp. I had a nightmare like that once, so it wasn't a bed lamp, I was trying to turn on my light and what did it turn on? Actually reminds me of the other story as well. I even tried turning on my phone, which wouldn't turn on. It starts out in one of those indoor soft play establishments, with all the slides, tunnels, and pads, scaffolding. I have a vague sense even now that I might have gone there as a kid, or maybe I just had this dream when I was younger. Either way, I'm a kid in the, in the dream. Not just in body, but mine too. Yeah, I remember those, like, McDonald's play places. When they were a thing, before they vastly fell out of style. In a dream, I'm missing a bout near the slides with another kid. A boy who looks roughly Dreamy's age. His head is shaven, it looks like, and he wears these thick Coke bottle eyeglasses that make his eyes big. So big, it's like they're ready to pop out of his sockets. And under his right ear, near the rim of the eyelid, is a mole. Oh, right eye. Okay. A real nasty one. The one you should get looked at. I don't know why that detail sticks out, it just feels important somehow. Anyway, we're loitering around the slides, playing some make believe. It's different every time, and the dream starts to start well after the rules are established, so I never remember what it's about. The other, this other kid's called Jay. I know that's a name. I know because that's the name I shout when he starts climbing up one of the slides. To me, it's one step short of breaking the law. Of course, my call goes unheeded, and Jay disappears into the slides, scratched plastic mall. Every time, I figured it'd be best to follow him and try to coax him back down. Child logic. Give me a break. The slide itself is enclosed and has round holes on both sides. 
For all the safety regulations around Slide, I they couldn't have built one less encouraging to break the, those rules. They're damn near perfect handholds. I keep pulling myself further up the slide, and it's and it always sounds as if Jay is right around the next bend. But I never catch up. That is, until the background noise of children laughing and squealing cuts out entirely. And I mean it cuts out. It's then I finally catch up to him, and I start to regret my decision to follow. Jay has turned around. Voices with both hands hooked into the holes on either side. Thought of asking what he's doing can reach I, before the thought of asking what he's doing can reach my lips. He kicks me square in the chest. Setting me down to slide in a ball of hurt and tumbling limbs. I'm not sure how long I'm stuck in this state. Feels like forever, even though it ends. God, I wish I was the end of the second dream, but I'm not so lucky. When I could finally feel hard plastic disappear from beneath me, the surface I crash into is in a cushioned mat. It's solid wood. After wincing, I open my eyes, expecting to see bright fluorescent lights overhead. I stare instead at nothing. To be precise, I stare air into unadulterated pitch blackness. Then I look around and I see some light that my eyes don't adjust. That'd be pointless in a dream. I can tell I'm in a small room from the moonlight leaking into the blinds. But they're clamped to the windowsill by a lock. I'm already scared at this point. Dream me can't be any older than eight, nine tops. I'm transferred back to a time where the darkness was real and coming to get me. The room is L-shaped. There is a door to my right. I try it, but it's locked. It's got one of those old keyholes, large enough to look through, and I do just that. Nothing but a dusty staircase. Sometimes it goes up, and sometimes down. Sometimes there's no staircase, it's just black. But every time, it's quiet. So quiet I can feel the silence. A heavy pile of dread in the air. Sorry, I just had to check. In the far corner by the window is Baby's cot. Empty. Eerie enough, if it weren't for the beady-eyed brown and bear reared up behind it. Taxidermy. The faintest suggestion of moonlight glints off those eyes, and its silvery outline is downright massive. It's horrifying. I know it's stuffed, but it feels so wrong. I had a deathly fear of bears as a kid, but in nightmares they showed up, and they were always alive, chasing me. Never like this. A monument of childhood terror. Harmless, yet more intimidating than ever. It's usually after seeing the bear that I start to shuffle into the corner furthest from it. Sometimes I'll go back to the keyhole and have that look. And I find that now there's something in front of it. It's too dark to tell, but I think I see movement. My eyes flick back to the stuffed bear. I'm scared that, no, I know that if I stay in the light, it'll come alive and maw me. Now I'm scared in the darkest corner, I bump against something. First, I think it's bending, but no, it's too coarse. That's what, for any comfort, I wrap my eyes around it and... To my mind-numbing horror, it's warm. It's hot. And it's when I rush through that heat that the thing I've suckled up next to lets out a deep, gurgling, carnivorous growl. There's no way for me to wake up with a start when that happens, so I don't know if that's where the dream is supposed to end or if I just don't want to experience whatever. Oh, for me to not wake up at the start. Okay. Or if I just don't want to experience whatever has its start. So I'll call that the end of dream two. I know, it's hard to see any relevance between this and the first dream. But just bear with me. <laughs> I can't believe the author actually said that. It all makes sense. 
I'm still figuring out how exactly it does. I'm not going straight into the third dream just yet, because I want to talk about Jason. I say we were friends in middle school, but acquaintances would be more accurate. I saw him in school, of course, but only a handful of times outside. And a good half of those would be chance encounters at parties or pubs. Ergo, I had more than a hard time getting into contact. He still has a Facebook page, but like a lot of us, he was away from the platform a while back. I resort to his mom's page, it's where there's a post about Jason's new website. He's a beat producer now, apparently. Real old school type rhythm. I actually got hooked listening to some of his samples before remembering why I was there. I found his contact email and a strong message with a little refresher to some who I was my mobile number. Within the same day, he got a asked me via text, as luck would have it, he lives in town next over. I asked if he was free for a catch-up. He said he was on Friday a morning, so I cleared my schedule and drove over there when the day came around. It's been the best part of the decade since I last saw him. So I didn't want to go straight into business after all that time. We made an tea shop a few blocks from his place and talked about how our lives had been going. I got married three years ago to my girlfriend Kim and have been on a steady freelance programming career for five. Jason has a boyfriend, not married but living together. He's in a bit of a rut financially but told me a, a, big, a grant app name has commissioned beats from him. So there's that. I held this conversation with as much sincerity as possible, knowing my reason for, for being there. I tried to bring it up naturally. In reality, there's no way to transition to dream talk in such a long way to for union. I wasn't even sure what I was looking to gain in talking about it. One thing pushed me to do so more than anything. Jason looked exactly as he does in the first dream. I haven't seen him for nearly 10 years. So I gotta ask, Jason Muse, why do you have to contact? Not that it's a bother or anything, but I'd be lying if I said I thought about you like, ever. No, I get it, I replied. It's just, okay, it's a little weird, but I've been having recurring dreams, and in one of them, you make an appearance. Jason sparked at this. Hmm, what kind of dreams are you talking about? I'm taking you know, so I hope you didn't come here to admit some repressed feelings. Though he obviously spoke in jest, I felt my cheeks flush and cursed myself for not thinking about how you'd interpret this. No, dude, nothing like that, I chuckled. It's different. The dreams, they're more like. How to put it, like they're halfway between dream and nightmare. <sighs> Cocking an eyebrow, Jason just stared at me, waiting for me to continue. I told him about the first dream, and unsurprisingly, he agreed. It was pretty bizarre how I dreamt his face as he looks now, when we hadn't seen each other for so long. Then I told him about the second dream. That's where things changed. I summed up in a much briefer manner than I, I've done here. Already, I could tell he felt uneasy. It was in his eyes. But it's when I got to the part about climbing up the slide, and those eyes got glassy. You okay? You're sweating. I asked. Jason shook his head, although apparently shedding the weight of something, or some of it at least. His lips parted and I could almost see the words being joined and nailed together in his head. The picture of his face made me shudder. It was the same as in a dream. What? 
This kid, do you remember what he looked like? I frowned, but described him as best as I could. Uh, right, yeah, about my age, I mean, I'm how old I am in the dream. Like seven, I guess. Thick glasses, short hair, maybe shaved, and a big puffy mole under his red eye. By the time I was done, Jason was still... I wasn't even sure he was breathing until he messaged a few choice words. On the brim of his eyelid. I gave him a puzzled... Odd look, concerned as to his sudden change in demeanor, but he answered before I could. I had a brother, you know, Jacob. We were tight twins, and the only way you could tell us apart was that mole under his eye. And glasses, of course. Hate and loved each other to bits. He got leukemia a month after his sixth birthday. He, he started choking up. I laid a hand on his shoulder, hoping to comfort him. And it worked, however slightly. Um, they had him on chemo right away. Things were looking up. Be it another two years. His hair started to grow back slowly, and I thought we were starting to look the same again. My brother took us out to one of those places. Those fucking play places. I thought he'd break down again, but he raised a hand and said his breath. And he did, too. Climbed the slide. I mean, I don't know what had gone into him and went after him. He knocked me back down. After all that, when my mom called us to leave, we couldn't find him. Had a whole staff team search that place top to bottom. And he was just... He was just gone. Not a trace. And the police search went cold from the outset. I struggled to find a response. I could think it was asked the only thing on my... On my mind. The burning question. Do you think I could have met Jacob once? He shook his head rapidly, flinging his hair in sweeps. We moved state after that. Mom and Dad couldn't handle it, and neither could I. You were born and raised, right? I can't remember ever coming in here before we moved. So, no. I don't think so. And then, how? I asked more to myself. Jason didn't reply. He only gazed off into the middle distance of his own mind. After sitting for a while, he sniffed and stood up from his seat. I gotta go. Then he left. I haven't heard a peep from Jason since. And again, I haven't tried to contact him either. Without drawing any reckless conclusions, I don't know what to make of what he told me. I've heard that when you dream, your brain doesn't make new faces. They're all people you've met before, one way or another. Maybe you could blend faces together to make a new one, it still doesn't explain the whole scenario. Oh, how, similarly, how similar it is to Jason's recollection. And like you said, I don't really believe I have met his brother. Or as... Oh. I'm born and raised, whereas he only moved here after Jacob's disappearance. We're getting to the half hour mark soon. The name is different. In the dream, the kid's name is Jay, although I can't imagine that being a shortening of the name Jacob. I mean, that can also be a shortening of the name Jason. Jason's involvement in these dreams only reaches the first two. The third and fourth are different. The set of elements they contain is more concerning. Not because of any immediate th threat implied or otherwise, but because of who's in them. At the start of the third dream, I'm in the driver's seat of a car. 
I recognize the car, the texture of the steering wheel, it's a smart driveway right now. What I don't recognize is the little boy sitting in the passenger seat. He hasn't got a booster seat, and while I feel he probably should, our destination is only a short drive from home. And I'm not worried, I already know all this when the dream starts. Despite not knowing who this boy is, I talk and joke with him like I do, who know him. There's one detail that still sticks with me, and that's his eyes. Chestnut with stark amber streaks. Just like mine. I want to ask him something, but I don't. I cannot, and I can never remember the question. Besides, I wanna, I won't have time. Because we've arrived, Thornton Gardens. I've been there before. It's only a mile or so out of town. It's a garden center. Kim loves her flowers and vegetables, and I've been on, on errand runs to the place more than once. When we pull into the parking lot, it's empty. Ours is the only car there, and after shutting the engine off, I find we were also the only source of noise. It's dead quiet now the engine's off, and it makes me worried. Not about anything for in particular. The air is just too still. Even the car door is slamming in as a boy, and I, I get out our jarring. When I see the entrance, so do I. I had a man sitting there. His outfit is bizarre. An insane cross between the overalls and button up of a farmer and a neat tailcoat suit. A sort of thing worn by the stereotypical butler. It's all in one piece and it's immaculate. Not a speck of dirt to be seen. I get the feeling he's been standing there, waiting for. Or as for a good while, and it disturbs me. Then the little boy says something, and I look down onto his face, full of excitement and wonderment and pressure filling off. The man nods and beckons the two of us inside, where he gives us a sort of tour of the place. The garden center is made up of several long, vaulted greenhouses side by side with iron pillars in place of glass. Maybe I'm lost in nostalgia for such a place, or I'm just not interested in what the man has to say. Because whatever he is saying sounds distant and almost ethereal. Echoes lost in a boundless dream world. Time passes and we wind up at the cactus section of the store. Here our guide stops and turns, looming over the boy with his eyes set on him. His lips stretch into a smile that seems contrived somehow. And he always asks in a low, slightly impatient voice, Would you like to see behind the curtain? I didn't think it right. I look down at the kid, anxious to hear his response. I don't know why. It's like this is all recording being played in my head. Because I desperately want to scoop him up and leave. The man feels dangerous. The boy squeaks a small mm-hmm, and the man outstretches a hand, which the boy takes gleefully. Every thought I have is screaming at me, but I don't move. I can't. The man shoots me a look before spinning on his heels and practically dragging the boy through a wrought iron arch into a kind of indoor garden display. A circular patio, bored by a wall of cacti so dense I can't see inside. A few minutes go by in silence and the man returns. Alone. Something breaks through inside me and I ask, Where is Michelle? Is that really her name? Michael? No, that doesn't look like a Michael. That's like a ch sound. That has to be. The T won't be there. It has to be Michelle. Interesting in name. Let's go. It's safe to assume that's the boy's name. I don't think I've even met a Michelle in my life. The man is staring into the distance, then looks at me like he forgot I'm here. 
That surprised expression crumbles away into nothing. His face is carved in stone, emotionless, like a lizard in a human body. He clears his throat and says, <clears throat> Slipped away. It's as if the floor has disappeared beneath my feet and is often enough to scare me awake. When it doesn't, the dream suddenly feels more real well, than before, and I launch myself at the man, flying to shove him past, shove past him and get into the uh, show garden. I rear my palms into him, and it has absolutely no effect. He doesn't move an inch, and it's like I'm fighting a granite monolith. He doesn't react either. He just, just keeps staring. Vacant and without a hint of emotion. I do, however, manage to peer over his so shoulder. This is as far as the third dream goes. And right before I end, I see the show garden. Just as I thought, it's a circular patio. And when my fi eyes find the middle of it, I see something shiny. Something colorful. Sometimes it's green, sometimes pink. Other times, it's a color we don't have a word for yet. You know those kinds of nightmares. The worst ones. Where you lose something so vital that for the few, first few seconds of wakefulness, your world is shattered. Then you realize, of course, that's only a dream. That's what this one feels like. Like I lost something so important to me that trying to describe the importance of language and words feels less than pointless. That writing it out would be an offense to truth and reality. That I, though I suppose that's what I'm doing, isn't it? I don't have much else to say about this one, so I'll keep it brief and, and go right into the fourth and final dream. I've been having these past mo as months. I don't know what I expect to gain from this. I certainly don't think anyone can provide me any help of any substance. No. I think having it all recorded so I can sit here and look at it all at once might just let me figure this out. Perhaps because it's the most recent, or, because, or perhaps it's the sheer terror of it. The fourth dream I can remember most vividly. I'm standing in the middle of my home street. Well, I recognize it as such. Now there are minor discrepancies that are natural for dreams. The sky is dark except for the moon, which could be full, a crescent, waxing or waning, but always dim. Otherwise, the sky is empty. There are no stars, no blinking planes, no gliding satellites, nothing. Honestly, these days, it's hard to see the stars because of light pollution. Anyway. The road is empty too. There isn't a parked car in sight. I don't hear anything either. It's our oh far past quiet that the silence screams in my ears. Like the air itself is solid and collecting around my eardrums, weighing me down. That's why it's so strange that I could feel a breeze. When I hear not a leaf upturned or nor a blade of grass whisper, the breeze is hot, it's humid, it carries a raw, meaty smell. This detail sticks out to me. Supposedly smells in dreams are especially rare. Less than half of us will smell anything in a dream in our entire life. On the thought of the wind and the leaves, I notice the trees. They're all bare. I don't see any dead leaves on the ground. In fact, the trees look dead, husky, and blackened, not like they do in winter. I'm walking down the road, along the white lines, so I'm not sure why. I guess it's because there's nothing else to do. I keep looking down at my feet, like I'm checking for something. Or waiting for something to appear.
I realize at an indeterminate point, I'm holding someone's one's hand. It doesn't surprise me. It feels natural. It feels right. The person behind me is talking from the tone and timbre. I don't know what that means. I can tell it's my I, my wife. Even if I can't tell, make out any of her words. Actually, what the hell does this mean? Did I even pronounce that right? I'll look it up later. I go to look at her, but before I do, a lone street heat lamp flickers to life ahead, illuminating a manhole cover that has been partially slid off its hole. The sight stops me dead in my tracks. Kim, on the other hand, continues walking. With an added grace in her step. When she feels the tug of my arm, she turns, asking, Aren't you coming? To that, I answer, I don't know. Are you sure? A, partic a particular melancholy shows in her face. Her eyebrows slant outwards and she pouts a little. At the corner of her, her mouth suggests a rueful and deeply knowing smile. You'll be left behind. I hang my head. I know. I'm sorry. I abandon weariness and the pair of us walk over to the manhole cover. We guide each other's steps, almost like we're dancing in a slow waltz. After a few good paces, the street lamp's orange glow reflects off of something underneath the manhole cover. It's barely visible through the slit of a, of a gap, but it looks hard. And shiny. Sometimes it's blue, or red, or green, or brown, or black, or white. The color stops mattering. Kim doesn't hesitate. She bends ends down, heaving the heavy iron disc aside. This is the only time in any of the dreams where I get a clear picture of this shiny object. This thing that is ubiquitous among, across them all. It's like the mouth of a slide, like from a swimming pool or an or indoor play place. It looks a curve and spiral downwards. The dread I feel in that moment is hard to describe. It feels like teetering on the edge of a whitewater rapid, thuttering towards a waterfall, and some unseen predator is closing in behind me. Like there's no more options. Kim looks up at me, her smile now hopeful, then proceeds to pull herself into the slide feet first. I reach out for her, but it's too late. She vanishes into the darkness. The darkness is somehow thicker and denser than the already dark sky above. She leaves me all alone. I'm frozen. The longer I stand there, the worse I start to feel. The world is shrinking in on me. It's pushing from all directions. How long I stand uncertain varies from dream to dream. If I wait long enough, a noise starts up off in the distance, and if I keep waiting, it gets louder. It gets louder and louder until it should early deafen me, but I hear it all the same. It sounds like the tired ticking of an old clock, a clock that's running out. Stress and fear notwithstanding, I never choose to follow Kim. I back away from the hole. And as I do, the ground works against me. It warps and tilts downward, forming a cone around me with the whole at its coal. Or, while I still manage to maintain my position, the asphalt turns smooth. It, no, it's like it's been coated in oil. There's no grip or purchase to be had. And I slip helplessly towards the slide. The ground bends up and up and seems to swallow the sky crashing down above me. 
right before I fall into the slides, hungry mall. Darkness involves me. I descend erratically, tumbling around of random turns that don't seem to make any sense. I'm smacked and dragged across hard plastic, burning and often tearing my skin. Falling down the slide becomes my only reality for as long as I can remember. The only sounds to accompany me to have been and those of my own. But as I slip further and further, my ears are introduced to something else. It's vague at first, kind of like radio static. After dozens and it's more painful bands, it grows louder. And I can make it out. It's screaming. A hundred. A thousand. It's a million voices screaming in a united chorus of grief and pain and torture. They get clearer as I roll helplessly in the dark, less and less muffled until the point where I know with unwavering certainty that the next band in the slide will sweep me out into wherever those screams are coming from. I always wake up before that band. Maybe this is all just coincidental happenstance so the details all match up. And they are only dreams. That's what I hope anyway. To be honest, I'd be happy to stop having them and never think about this again. Unfortunately, I think I'm past that point. I mentioned earlier that our brains don't invent new faces and dreams. Sometimes it mixes features, but there's always a tinge of familiar, a familiarity. I keep thinking about Jason and his brother. Sure, I've seen Jason before, but the version of him I remember is a teenager. Not the one in my dream. Well, up until recently. His brother, though, I don't see how it's possible it isn't. Then there's the third dream. That little boy. I know for sure I've never seen him before. Even so... There's something about him. It's not that I recognize him. The only spark that flies from seeing him is those eyes. Those amber-streaked chestnut eyes, just like mine. I still lead in towards something psychological, even with the unexplainable aspects. But you see, Kim and I have been trying for a year now, on and off, until 18 weeks ago, when she tested positive. Since then, she's been and to have ultrasounds, they're not always 100% accurate, but she's been twice now and she insists on the results. It's going to be a boy, and Kim's already got a name. And actually, that's the end of the story. Wow, I read that whole entire story and kind of just assumed that OP was as a chick. That's on me. If you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, so until then, goodbye! Try not to have too many bad dreams.